World's mightiest man is Captain Marvel, whose matchless strength, wisdom, stamina, power, courage, and speed aid him in his never-ending battle against crime and injustice. But in everyday life, he is Billy Bats and Boy Radio reporter, who can become Captain Marvel at will merely by speaking the magic word, Shazam. Hello everybody, this is Billy Batson, your radio reporter. This time I'm taking you way up to the polar regions on the strangest assignment any news hawk ever undertook. Seeking a story, Billy Batson boards the freighter Red Star scheduled to sail at midnight on a scientific expedition to the North Pole. Looks as if they're about ready to shove off. Wonder why all the secrecy? Machine guns! Why would anybody take these on a scientific expedition? As he looks curiously at a damaged crate on the freighter's deck, a harsh voice suddenly speaks. Hey kid, what are you doing on this boat? I'm Billy Batson, Captain. I came to get a story about the expedition. Well, there isn't any story, see? So scram. The speaker is Rodney Stark, wealthy young sportsman who is financing the venture. Maybe you'll know enough next time not to pry into other people's affairs. When Billy hesitates, Stark throws him bodily off the freighter. Someday, maybe I'll have a chance to do the same for you, Mr. Rodney Stark. A few minutes later, the freighter casts off and steams seaward on its strange mission. Six months pass. Sterling Morris, president of Amalgamated Broadcasting, summons his ace radio reporter to his private office. Billy, do you remember Rodney Stark, who sailed from New York a few months ago on an expedition to the North Pole? I'll say I do, Mr. Morris. Whatever happened to him? Stark's freighter, the Red Star, was last sighted two months ago heading north from Greenland. Not a word has been heard from the expedition since. This morning, six army planes making a round-the-world flight stopped in Greenland to refuel. An hour after they landed, all the flyers were mysteriously killed and their planes stolen. Gee, that's terrible. But where does Rodney Stark come in? The point is this. The killers approached Greenland by sea in a motor launch from the freighter Red Star. Maybe they wiped out Stark's expedition first. You're going up there to find out. Next day, after a non-stop flight from New York, Billy lands his plane on the barren, windswept Greenland refueling base where the army flyers were attacked. You say the bandits landed in that boat? What did they look like? Son, they were the most ferocious looking fellers I ever see. They look like animals. Dirk Svensson, aged fisherman who takes care of the lonely refueling base, is still frightened by his experience, but tells Billy the story. Just before noon, Svensson relates, a strange band of fierce, primitive men landed on the beach below the flying field. Oh, they got me. If only we had our guns. Taking the army pilots by surprise, the savage newcomers mowed them down in cold blood with machine guns, which they handled expertly. When all the flyers were killed, the giant savages took the controls of the plane and headed out to sea, due north, in perfect flying formation. Why didn't they kill you too, Mr. Svetson? I hide when I see them come. They don't find me, else I die too. When Billy takes off in pursuit a few hours later, he does not realize that a time bomb has been fastened to the undercarriage of his plane. Billy Batson, radio, reporter, trailing, you, by, plane, do not worry, I, fixed, him. Nor does he realize that the treacherous Dirk Svensson at that very moment is radio telegraphing a message ahead, far out over the trackless wastes of the polar ice pack, the deadly time bomb performs its grim mission, blasting Billy's plane into a thousand pieces. There's only one thing that can save me now. Shazam! Hurled into space by the terrific detonation, Billy manages to speak the magic word. Miraculously, a huge black thundercloud forms, a deafening lightning bolt darts from it, and... If it wasn't so cold, I'd say this is a case of out of the frying pan into the fire. Captain Marvel, world's mightiest man, drops towards the menacing figure of a gigantic polar bear. As he lands, the savage beast grabs him in a bone-crunching embrace, which would shatter an ordinary man's back. So, you're a dancing bear, eh? Okay, chum, let's dance. And don't step on my feet. But Marvel dexterously leaps backward into the air and... Nothing like a little somersault winter weather to warm you up, eh, pal? 
Back home, we call this the Polar Bear Polka. Completing the somersault, he lands with full force on the startled animal, knocking it unconscious. You'd better take a nice long snooze, partner. The way your cousins down south do all winter. After disposing of the bear, the world's mightiest man searches in the debris of the Deplane which he, as Billy Batson, had almost been killed. That bomb certainly did a bang up job on my airplane. Ah, here's what I'm looking for. Luckily, he finds the wrecked plane's compass, for not even Captain Marvel's super sensitive perception can tell him the correct directions in this vast, uncharted wasteland of snow and ice. Compass in hand, Marvel zooms through the air due north on the trail of the murderous bandits. Must be almost at the North Pole now. I wonder what's behind those mountains. I'd better take a look. Behind the mountains, on a huge flat expanse of ice, the bandits have improvised a landing field. By Hercules, there they are. The army of planes that were stolen at Greenland. Fearing that his presence has been observed, Captain Marvel speaks the magic word. That's the strangest thing I ever saw. Those planes just vanished into thin air. I'd better vanish too. Shazam! A mighty peal of thunder echoes across the Arctic wastes and... The world's mightiest man again becomes Billy Batson, radio reporter, in search of a scoop. Maybe they saw me and maybe they didn't. I'd better keep behind cover. Suddenly he slips on a smooth glass-like sheet of ice and tumbles headlong into a deep crevasse. Good gosh, I'm a goner now. As he lands unconscious on the floor of an under ice chamber, two huge shaggy figures approach and look down at his prostrate figure. White boy, fall from sky. We take him to master. Billy regains consciousness to find himself helpless in the powerful grip of one of the two men. What? What happened? Where? Who are you? No talk, white boy. Within a few minutes, his captors take him to a colossal room carved out of solid ice. Startled, Billy sees human figures frozen into the walls in lifelike postures. We find white boy, master. White boy? Where did he come from? Bring him here. So, it's the little brat that tried to get a story from me in New York, eh? You're a persistent kid, aren't you? I just wanted to find out about your expedition, that's all. The mysterious white master of the strange looking men is Rodney Stark. Okay, sonny boy. I'll tell you all about it, for all the good it'll ever do you. Sneering, the sportsman explorer discloses that he has discovered an entire tribe of Pleistocene men frozen alive in solid ice. Thousands of years before, when the great polar glaciers swept down over the world to mark the beginning of the Ice Age. Most fantastic of all, Rodney Stark has discovered a method of bringing these ancient savages back to life. The secret of Stark's method is an ingenious device which the explorer himself built. You see, my nosy little guest, this machine melts the ice slowly, gradually defrosting the frozen men and restoring their blood circulation. It takes two hours to bring each man back to life. Even as he speaks, the defrosting period ends and the once frozen man steps forward. Golly, he's alive! Correct. What's more, his super body is now driven by a super brain. He can't speak English, yet but the thousands of years of intense cold have sharpened his intelligence almost to perfection. Watch. Ningorg nyagat nyanyak. Place that machine before the next man. Yam yam shkanya. Yes, master. Speaking a language not heard for thousands of years, Stark orders the man to adjust the complicated machine for its next task, and the man obeys. Gee, he operates that machine as if he knew all about modern science. He does, and within a week, I shall have a thousand men, just like him, ready and willing to obey my slightest command. But what are you going to do with them? What's the idea of all of this? It sounds screwy to me. See the arrows on that map? They indicate the routes my men will follow as they conquer the world. And nothing can stop us. Nothing. In a vast, under-ice workshop, Rodney Stark's men are busily engaged in duplicating the fastest, most powerful airplanes in existence. My men stole those army planes at Greenland so that they could make hundreds of exact copies of them. In those planes, we will bring civilization to its knees. Stark paints a terrifying word picture of his plans. You think I'm mad, do you, you little fool? Well, I'm not, and the world will soon know it. You wanted a story, here it is. My men will attack every major city in the world. New York, London, Paris, Moscow. None will escape. The Nazis' invasion of Poland will be child's play compared to this. 
Even if they shoot down all our planes, my men cannot lose. Why? Because nothing, not even a high explosive shell at close range, can kill my men. In a month I shall rule the earth and no one will dare dispute the command of Dictator Stark. The Americans disobey, kill them. Wipe out every man, woman and child in the country. Well, Brat, you've got a great story and here's the wind up to it. So long, have an ice time. Hey, you can't do a thing like this. Final plans for his world's conquest completed. Rodney Stark thrusts Billy into a sub-zero dungeon in the ice. I'd freeze to death in here in an hour. This is a job for Captain Marvel. Shazam! Lightning flashes, thunder roars, and the world's mightiest man crashes up from his under ice prison. I've got to stop those planes before they wreck the world. At that moment, hundreds of planes flown by the gigantic Pleistocene men emerge from their subsurface hangar. So, they're just starting out, eh? Well, they won't get far. His powerful muscles rip the cabin top from one of the planes. Greetings, mate. I'm afraid you're not going to keep that appointment in New York. Hurling the plane overboard, Captain Marvel takes charge of the situation. Happy landing, pal. And thanks for the airplane. Fearlessly, he steers the racing craft directly at the foremost of the raiding planes. Football players back home call this little stunt taking out the interference. As the two planes collide at blinding speed, the others following behind pile up amid wild confusion. Looks as if we've got a traffic jam on our hands, boys. Let's see you unsnarl it. Plummeting down, the wrecked airplanes drop into the huge opening in the ice made by Marvel. Rodney Stark's ship, the only one to escape the mass crash, dives on the world's mightiest man, motors roaring. Come on, let's see whether a man is stronger than an airplane. H who are you? Where did you come from? You better start worrying about yourself, chum, and forget about me. His plane wrecked by the impact, Rodney Stark plunges into the crevice where the other ships fell. Too bad, but you had it coming to you. Suddenly a deafening detonation rends the air as gasoline tanks of the fallen airplanes explode. Rodney Stark's mad plot to conquer the world has failed. Speeding homeward, Captain Marvel speaks the magic word which will restore him to his normal appearance. I'm just in time for tonight's broadcast. Shazam! So that was the end of Rodney Stark's plan to conquer the Earth, folks. And it's the end of my broadcast, too. Good night. A half hour later, Billy Batson, America's ace radio reporter, broadcasts another sensational scoop. Don't miss next month's thrilling adventure of Captain Marvel exclusive in Wiz Comics.